Cleveland native Casey Daniels is the author of the Pepper Martin Supernatural Romance Mystery Series. She's written under eight pseudonyms? I think it's 12. 12 pseudonyms? But we who's came counting? Close. Who's counting? We don't do research. And uh, has a thing for anything old, dead, and dying. Yes. It seems like. She's a cemetery tour guide, or has been, and is here to talk about her career as a writer. Welcome to Craft. Thank you. Casey Daniels. Thank you, thank you. So I think we've spoken before. Yes, a long time ago. Fill me, uh, you, not that long. I'm only oh. 22. Oh, well, fill me in on, yes, on what you've been doing lately. What are the new books? About? Well, there is a new Pepper Martin book okay. that came out last, whenever, uh, last winter, I think. It was, it's hard to remember. Yes. It's called Graveyard Shift, and that's the 10th Pepper Martin mystery. And Pepper works at a cemetery in Cleveland, and she solves mysteries for the ghosts in the cemetery. Mm -hmm. So book number 10, I messed around with, gee, who could be my ghost? And I came up with Elliot Ness, so that was kind of fun. Um, my cemetery in the books is based on an actual cemetery in Cleveland. I call it a different name. Uh, and Elliot Ness is actually not buried there. He is sprinkled there. Uh, but <laughs> the basis of the book is Elliot Ness's ghost comes to her because those weren't his ashes that were sprinkled. Okay. And so she needs to find the real ashes is basically what it was. Right. So that's what's happening with Pepper. Okay. Um, I also have a new historical mystery series. Uh, the first book is called Smoke and Mirrors. It's the first in the Miss Barnum mysteries. I have given P.T. Barnum a fictional sister. He had four. This is number five. Um, because one of the things I didn't know about Barnum was that he owned a place called Barnum's American Museum in New York, opened in 1841, and it was fabulous. It was five floors of craziness. There was a whale, a real whale in a tank. Um, you could take... Like a live whale? Like a live or, whale. How did they keep yeah. a live whale alive? How did they get him? I don't know. Right, right. I, one Magic. assumes they let it in with a string of plankton they could have. and they just yeah, put it into shrimp, the tank. You know, yeah. yeah, yeah, could have been. Um, you could take a balloon ride, a hot air balloon ride from the roof. You, I, just this really interesting place. And the thing that really made Barnum's name was the Fiji mermaid. Mm -hmm. uh, he advertised before the, the mermaid went on display, uh, lots of advertising, and letters in newspapers all over the country from eminent scientists saying, wow, this is the most incredible find ever. Well, Barnum wrote all those letters. Of course. Uh, he would just sign someone else's name to them. And uh, that really, in 1842, they had 15,000 people a day coming through the museum at 25 cents a piece. Um, so he was making, I'm bad at math, but over $4,000 a week in 1842, which is not bad. Right. So anyway, I've given him a sister who works at the museum with him because I just thought this place was too good not to play with. Her name is Evie, and in the first chapter of the book, an old friend comes to see her, and later that day she finds him dead in front of the Fiji mermaid. Mm -hmm. So she becomes the amateur sleuth. Okay, and the Fiji mermaid was, I believe, a corpse that had fish a tail attached to it It was the something? head of a monkey, Okay. The body of an orangutan. Good. And the tail of a fish. Mm -hmm. A large fish. Yes. Okay. Although the whole thing was maybe, you know, this big total. Mm. Um, they were made in Japan. I think it was either the 15th or 16th century. If you were a taxidermist, the way you proved your skill was to make one of these. Mm. And the finer it was, the more skilled taxidermist mm -hmm. you were. So he got a hold of one of these taxidermied things, called it a mermaid, thought it was hilarious, mm -hmm. and put it on display and got really rich. So are there a bunch of other of these things just, just floating around? Because his the, the museum burned down, as I The museum recall. burned down in 1865. I had a line on one. I heard there was supposed to be the real Fiji mermaid had been saved, and it was up at St. Bonaventure University in New York. Mm -hmm. I don't know how true that is. Someday I may get up there and, and find out. It's P.T. Barnum. It's as true as every headline that we have today. 
Uh, yes. in the newspaper. Well, go just figure. honest, honest, yes. only the honest truth. No fake news. No fake news. Is what Not we're getting with at with Barnum. <laughs> Um, so tell me about uh, writing about un writing under pseudonyms. What is the attraction to that? You get to, I guess, move into different areas, but your name is large on this book. My name is large. large. Isn't that nice? It's, it's, it's not. If I write a book, it's going to be the title, my name in four point type. That's right. This this proves I'm pretty cool. Yeah. When I started writing the Pepper Martin mysteries as Casey Daniels, and I had written some other under some other names before that. Uh, those, those are fun, got to do those, had a lot of fun. And then I had an idea for a traditional mystery, no ghosts. And the publisher was afraid if people saw the Casey Daniels name on the front of mm. those books, they would assume there were ghosts in them. So I became Kylie Logan for my straight traditional mysteries. The Casey name is on this book, there are no ghosts. But the whole museum thing is a little out there. It's right. it's it's darker than my traditional mysteries, right. and it's a little skewed. Uh, so that's that's so, why Casey stayed with. The so we're not giving away anything by saying that the Fiji, Mer Fiji mermaid is not a suspect. She is not. Point. She doesn't okay. get around much. Okay. Right. Well, plankton or no plankton, she's not going anywhere. Right. Yeah. Well, you know, you'd think with just a tail, it's difficult to motivate on yeah. on the ground. So. You, as I understand it, rode with your father in a police car when, when you were young. Yes. Right? Yes. Tell me about that. What, what, why? Well, we'd go look for stolen cars, of course. <laughs> so you would take, you, how old were you? Oh, I have a sister who's 10 years younger than me who never did it. So I was young. Okay. I'm probably five and six and seven and eight when we're doing this. We didn't actually go in the police car. Oh. He would okay. do this on his days off or his times off. Okay. He was a detective with the Cleveland Police Department. And he, for a while, he worked in what was called the Auto Bureau. Mm -hmm. They would look for stolen cars. So we would go out and look for stolen cars. And that was long before cell phones. And I remember he would then come home and he'd call the station. And he had a great memory, and he'd give him the license plate number. That's at this corner, and oh, this one, we saw this one there. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, buy the kid an ice cream cone, load her in the car, go look for stolen. But never deputized you to no. chase uh, over a nice chasing, because that would make a good uh, scene in a you know a, a, bib a biography or something, right? You, the two of you, ice cream chasing cars down. I don't think chased anybody but I like the idea and I am a fiction writer yes yeah, so you I can do you, that you are one of, so then this was in the city of Cleveland right yes yeah, as you yes. said and, and uh, what sort of things did this do for you when you got to tell other kids at school was this a, a secret secret oh, or no. could you it, say it, well we really got them that we we pulled over a Rolls Royce we found seven David. stolen cars this weekend right. the best thing it did for me is I know I now know my way around the city mm -hmm. because we'd go to the odd places strange places if there's a tie up on the freeway I can find my way around any neighborhood in town. So that's a, that comes in handy. So were there particular places that you now look at and you say, yeah, we used to come down here looking for cars. This area seemed oh, yeah. to attract the cars. Yeah, and I'm thinking most of Cleveland because I'm not from there, but I'm kidding. But uh, were there, there times when you just said, oh, this is really great. Keep your eyes peeled for stolen cars, kids. Yeah. Yeah, okay. Yeah. <laughs> it was great. <laughs> it's a wonderful <laughs> memory. <laughs> It just seems like a strange way to spend a day off, although I... Uh, you didn't know my dad. Yeah. You know, uh, he was a cop through and through, and that's mm -hmm. what you did. Would that lead to anything, like as a, a, as a young person, that you had earlier curfews than other people, or the, the rules were really strictly enforced? It, it led to a lot of very scared boyfriends. <laughs> <laughs> um, as a matter of fact, I have a friend from Columbus named Joe. Hi, Joe, if you're out there watching, uh, who was a buddy all through school. And I met him for lunch recently, and for some reason my, my dad came up and he said, I've never told you this. He scared the hell out of me. I said, yeah, he was supposed to. That was his job. Is he like, let me show you my weapons. Let yeah. me show you the gun, the nightstick, yeah. the, all that kind yeah, of let stuff. Let me just walk through the kitchen wearing my sidearm. See, right. see what you think of that. So how many um, policemen heroes have you been able to put into your books? Oh, lots. Um, okay. Although I'm getting a little tired of that sort of shtick. Uh, so many amateur sleuth books because your, your detector, you detective 
is not a professional, there's got to be some connection in the book to a real to real right. law enforcement. So in so many of them, you know, the boyfriend is is a cop or and I'm getting a little tired of that. So I'm trying to find different ways to bring in law enforcement. Okay. Um, tell me about the allure, which is something that I, I have as well, the allure for you of horror or of the supernatural or things that uh, are not really there, but you get to say they are. Not horror, because I'm the biggest chicken in the world. Really, I would think supernatural wouldn't, it wouldn't, does, so the ghosts never attack anybody. Oh, sure they do. Okay. But that doesn't scare me. I mean, it's not like Stephen King. There's nothing okay. graphic or, or scary. As far as the supernatural, I believe in it. Uh, I believe in so-called ghosts or spirits or whatever you want to call it. I've seen plenty of proof of it. Uh, and so it's just, I think it's a, a fun way to add a little twist to a story, make it a little different. I just finished a short story, not published yet, hopefully it will be, with zombies in it. Now I've never done zombies before, okay. but that was kind of fun. But the zo so what, last question. What does, you said you're the biggest chicken, what does scare you as the writer of Supernatural? Do you, and do you run into p times where you're sitting going, oh, I don't want to write that, it's too frightening. No, no, don't do that. What scares me? Lots of things scare me. The world. <laughs> I think that's the nice part about fiction, you know? I get to be the goddess of my universe, and I get to control what happens here. And then you get up and you watch the news and you go, whoo. <laughs> That's much worse. Yeah, That's, way worse. Ooh, Washington, I'll take supernatural DC. any uh, day. Yeah. Well, Casey Daniels, I thank you very much thank for talking you. to me today at the 2018 Ohio Anna Book Festival. Again, your latest book is Smoke, Smoke and Mirrors, Mirrors, and uh, people can buy that at all fine retailers. Yes, they can.